Hi, and welcome back. I really wanted Isra to have two friends and two friends that were very different. So on one side, she has Da, who's very sarcastic and, you know, kind of tough. And on the other side, she has Sunny, who's quiet but gentle and a little tougher than people gave her credit for. I thought that by having these women with her, it would kind of help balance out her, but also add another dimension to the story because previously when we had met Isra, Isra was very much in her head and, uh, well, very angry in her head, but I wanted to bring her out so you could see her personality. Let's find out why Sunny calls her husband the donor. I knew he sold drugs. He never bothered to hide it from me. For many, many years, I just turned my head the other way. It was easy to do so. I didn't have to participate in his crimes. His trafficking put food on our table clothes on my back, and it paid for my mother's operation, which he never failed to remind me of. Sometimes at night, I can still hear his voice coming out of the dark to patronize me. It's because of me and my work this family eats. You're lucky because of, without me, your mother would be dead. I knew this to be true. So I was grateful to him, even somewhat enamored, because he put himself at risk for our beloved family. Every time I went to visit my mother, I would throw my arms around her neck and sob, forever indebted to my husband and his job. The donor wanted me to get pregnant and have a little boy. He promised when I got pregnant, he'd stop selling drugs and stupidly, I believed him. When I discovered I was pregnant, it was the best moment in my life. The best. I floated merrily along, consumed with the knowledge that there was a tiny being growing inside my womb. I never thought I could feel as happy as I did. For a few days, I greedily savored the secret. I was reluctant to share it, even with my husband. I knew he'd be delighted at the news, but the source of joy tingling within me was, at that moment, too great to disclose to anyone, including my baby's father. A few days turned into four, then five, and finally, three weeks later, I told him he was going to be a father. He was, as I knew he would be, elated. I even felt a bit guilty for not telling him sooner. I don't really know why I didn't, other than I felt I needed to become acquainted with my baby before anyone else did. As my stomach grew, he watched me with what I thought was genuine enthusiasm about the baby. I remember when my stomach broke beyond my hip bones, he proudly proclaimed, you look pregnant. You really, really look pregnant. I laughed at this and teased him. Really, really pregnant? There's no such thing. You're either pregnant or you're not. He slapped me hard across the cheek. It was the first and only time he ever hit me, and it should have been my first clue. His fascination with my growing stomach continued until I discovered why. One day, somewhat apprehensively, he asked me to help him. I have something to ask you. I know you're not going to like it, but I need you. Our unborn son and I need you. The tension his face confirmed what I already knew. I wasn't going to like his request. I need you to carry some drugs for me, he said. They'll never suspect a big pregnant lady. You're perfect. You're big, you're pregnant, and you're perfect. I couldn't believe my ears. I couldn't. He 
you're going to want me to carry drugs. It was more of a statement than a question. There was no way that I was going to agree. It was one thing to know about my husband's involvement in illegal activities and quite another for me to become involved. I was pregnant. I was afraid. I didn't want this risk. But he was persuasive. He kept insisting that he needed me, that our unborn child needed me, and that I had to do this for our family. And finally, he won over any apprehension I had. He was my husband. What else could I do? And besides, he promised this would be the last time. Only one time, he said. I was helping our family, our unborn child. I agreed to it. How could I not, Isra? How could I not? He told me that the police would never suspect a pregnant woman. I was one mule in a long train of carriers. But I never got out of the house. It was as if the police already knew. The bags were packed, filled with 10 kilos of heroin, and I was waiting for my husband to come home with instructions. He never came home, and I haven't seen him since. You already know the outcome. I'm jammed in here with everyone else waiting for a trial, at which I'll be convicted. I didn't receive any special treatment or leniency just because I'm pregnant. <laughs> After all, I'm just a stupid woman. You're not stupid for wanting a better life for your child. You're a mother who loves her child, I said, trying to reassure her. As we sat in silence, our thoughts traveled to unsettling places. We both wondered how she would care for a child in an environment not conducive to raising one. For bonding purposes, new mothers like Sunny and their infants could keep them in prison. And Sunny told me, she would try. Her family fortunately lived close to Chiang Mai and would bring her food whenever they could and extra money and spare diapers. Suni was determined. It was the aspect of her character I most admired. She was not unaware of the challenges facing her. One of her biggest concerns was her diet. Isra, I worry about nursing my baby. I'm afraid my milk won't come, and if it does, it'll be white water. She'd said this more than once. The night Suni went into labor, none of us slept for fear something would happen to her. Da and I and all the women prayed for a safe delivery and a healthy baby. We knew Suni was in good hands. She was taken to the hospital to give birth, but we still worried about our friend, and we feared for her and her baby's future. The following evening, when we finally received word that Sunny had delivered a baby girl, the tension lifted from our cell, as did the mist from the early morning jungle, morning jungle, and we eagerly awaited the arrival of mother and child. I didn't have a child and could not imagine what it was like to carry a small life inside you, to feel it grow, and your body to grow to accommodate it. I've known many pregnant women over the years and, and witnessed their transformation from woman to mother with endless fascination. Did motherly love begin at the moment of conce conception or did it intensify with the passing of time? Or perhaps the love was already there, waiting to be released by a tiny fluttering inside the womb. When Sunny returned and baby Ratana made her entry into prisoner's life, a protective veil wrapped itself around mother and child. Small gifts of fruit and nuts found their way into Sunny's hands. We all wanted her to maintain her strength. Public donations solicita solicited from the Chiang Mai community helped subsidize the nursing mother's diet. Unfortunately, those donations were irregular and could not be depended upon to sustain her. Inmates who had not been previously acquainted with Sunny 
became friendly out of the desire to secure a few precious moments with Ratana. Holding Ratana melted away everything wrong in our lives. I remember the first time I felt the warmth of her body press against mine, and I felt love. Sunny confessed to Da and I that she was intimidated by the enormity of her responsibility and racked by an overwhelming feeling of helplessness that pressed constantly against her chest. Sunny was one of 13 mothers in, that lived in prison in the nursery with her child. She told us she would wake during the night and find tears streaming down her face for no apparent reason other than to fertilize the fear that was growing in her chest. Every night, her fear grew greater, pressing down against her chest until the weight of it made it impossible for her to sleep. Sunny would lie awake at night, night after night, watching her fear grow until it filled the room and she could no longer breathe. Fearful she would stop breathing, Sunny would bolt upright, making a conscious effort to force air into her lungs. If her thoughts wandered elsewhere, the air would become stuck in her throat and Sunny had to force it down to pry the air out. Dark circles formed and her eyes blackened around. Nothing curtailed Sunny's fears. Despite the generosity of others, Sunny withered before our eyes and Ratana could not flourish on Sunny's love alone. As Ratana's small frame became undernourished, Sunny's breathing was a battle she was losing. Giving up Ratana was the hardest thing Sunny had ever done. When Ratana was eight months old, she went to live with Sunny's sister, has, sister, sister, her sister's husband, and their three children. After Ratana left, a part of her died, she told us. The presence of death stared out of her eyes, patiently waiting to take the rest of her. When she returned to our dormitory cell from the nursery, Da and I would take turns cradling Sunny's emaciated frame in her arms until she was finally able to fall asleep. I couldn't help but think as, Sunny, as I held Sunny that the one thing that my no good husband did was not impregnate me. I always give him too much credit. I didn't let him. I was too busy building my business empire. Sunny's family regularly brought Ritana to see her. Each visit, however, brought a different heartache, blurring the lines between pleasure and pain. It became agonizingly obvious to Sunny that the bond between mother and child had passed between them and was going with her sister. Five years had passed and Sunny became more and more distraught about their weakening bond. She wrote to her daughter regularly in an attempt to repair their fraying connection and proudly presented us with the colored drawings of her little artist. The drawings always depicted elements of Ritana's life and we looked forward to the glimpses of a world presented to us through the eyes of a five-year-old. Ritana loved hummingbirds and for months we were delighted by her colorful drawings of hummingbirds drinking from oversized purple and orange flowers. Da used to say with a big smile, Sunny, I don't know what you enjoy more, the hummingbirds or the, or the glee jumping from those cheeks when you show us those drawings. The pride burning from your cheeks is making it hot in here. Sunny, oblivious to the teasing, would respond by saying, Ritana is going to be a famous artist. She's very talented. Look at the detail in these flowers. You would never know they were drawn by a five-year-old. We would all nod in agreement, even if we didn't have the slightest clue to what detail she was referring to. 
Da and I became good at recognizing which envelope contained Ratana's artwork, but we could never manage to find it before Sunny did. It was an ongoing competition between the three of us when the mail was distributed to determine if there was something for Ratana. Sunny, eyes shining, always spotted the envelope first. As the years passed through those drawings, we became acquainted with a little girl who never filed, failed to make us smile. As Ratana learned to print, she began to label her drawings, sky, sun, cloud, rainbow, and her signature would be proudly displayed in the bottom right-hand corner. Sunny gingerly opened the latest treasure, informing us. It won't be much longer. Soon, Ratana will be able to write letters to me. I can't wait. I love to see her drawings, but to hear her little voice in a letter would be wonderful. As Sunny unveiled Ratana's artwork, she basked in the idea of her daughter being able to write letters, and she did not process the content of the latest picture. I felt Daw's hand instinctively clap onto mine, squeezing it hard. The drawing that Sunny held was labeled My Family, depicted in bright shades of pink, yellow, and green, the rounded bodies of her aunt, uncle, three cousins, and Ratana. They were all holding hands and big smiles. In the background, located in the far right corner, was a tiny black cage. Inside the cage was a stick figure dressed in black with a large, sad, black mouth. Beneath the cage, neatly printed, was the word, Mummy. In car in car <laughs> uh, incarceration and depression were of the same hand. It was a distinct cycle most of us rode back and forth. Sunny was no different from the rest of us, but she hid it better than most. Sunny never admitted to her black periods. She internalized her emotions, burying them deeper by the day. Da and I knew her best. The three of us were inseparable, and we recognized the cracks. We tried to comfort her as best we could, but there was always an undercurrent of grief that took her to places we could not reach. Afterwards, the darkness returned. We, her closest friends, help, helplessly witnessed the light being exhumed from her body. In the light in Sunny's large black eyes slowly became extinguished. It seemed even the most recent drawing from her daughter. Ritana was going through a sunri and sunrise and sunset phase, could not ignite the light. Daw and I became increasingly troubled. We had to do something. I had managed to save together a few bat and had formulated a plan. Daw thought I was crazy and told me as much, but when it came time to execute the plan, Daw contributed some of her own savings. One night, 6 p.m., when we were locked in our dormitory, cell for the night, I beckoned one of the guards. Negotiations began. Sunny was puzzled, watching us and wondering what Daw and I were up to. When we finished our negotiations, Two of us were permitted to leave the cell. Isra, you go with Sunny. It was your idea, Da said. Taking Sunny by the hand, I led her out of the prison and into the courtyard stuffed with can of flowers. A confused Sunny asked, what are we doing? When I did not answer, she asked again, what are we doing, Isra? Placing both hands on her shoulders, I gingerly turned her body to face the west. Our timing could not have been more perfect. The sun was just beginning to set. A sharp gasp came from Whitsunny, followed by a river of tears. Draping my arm around Sunny's waist, we stood, we watched. The day had been cloudy, 
and full of mounds of white fluffy clouds covered the indigo in mountainous patches. The sun obliged as if it too had been bribed to perform for Sunny. Slowly it transformed the sky into fire orange and scarlet. The clouds greedily tried to possess the orange, but it revolted, generating an electric streak that lined the bottom edges with orange and gold lighting. Vibrations of color shimmered up through white puffs, metamorphosing into a rebellious shade of lavender gray that deepened in hue as the sun bid the sky good night and traveled downwards to meet the horizon. Sunny and I stood amongst the canna flowers, the last burst of light coming through the leaves. Not a word passed between us. When the sun had finally gone to bed, Sunny's hand covered mine, which was still resting around her waist. Her thankful squeeze touched my heart in a way I didn't think possible. And I vowed when I got out of prison, I would find a way for her to watch the sunset again and again. Tomorrow, we will find out what's happening in Cambodia. Thank you for listening.